Okay, in this segment, we are going to deal with the topic of miracles. What are miracles, and do they still occur today? Um, let me begin by reading just one text of Scripture from Acts 2.22. Men of Israel... Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as ye yourselves know. If ever <laughs> there was a topic where definitions are needed, this is it. If I were to talk to 10 different people, I would get 10 different definitions of miracles and examples of them. To some, a miracle is a lovely sunset. To others, the birth of a child. Still others, answers to prayer would be a miracle. And to still others, they say that miracles have ceased since the age of the apostles. Actually, the list is much longer, but that's a representative sampling of the wide diversity of opinions regarding miracles. So what do we say about miracles? Boy, y'all, I have tried hard. Um, I've tried to in all my uh, these segments, but especially in this one, to put, my, uh, put into practice the adage of the Reformed, that the Reformed Church is always reforming. That is, I, I have sincerely tried to set aside prior conceptions about miracles and asked myself afresh the question regarding miracles. What does the Bible teach? I want to know the truth. And I want to teach the truth. And I don't want to go to one unbiblical extreme or another. And I do not want God to put God in a box, but I also want to adhere to um, sola scriptura, scripture alone. I want to experience God in his fullness and not hear him say to me on, on Judgment Day, Mark, you are a man of little faith, but... On the other hand, truth is our guide, God's word. So please, everyone, let's put aside as best we can our prior assumptions and listen afresh, okay? And I know everybody, or a lot of people have very strong opinions about this, um, but let's, let's, let's work through this together, okay? Okay, what about some of the definitions of miracles? And here, here are three common replies. First definition of miracle is that a miracle is occurs when God intervenes in the world. Miracles are when God intervenes in the world. Okay, my reply is that I'm sure miracles include that, but I don't think that's an adequate definition because of, for one, God's providence. Is he not constantly intervening in some sense? The Westminster Shorter Catechism states, what are God's works of providence? The answer, God's work, works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. And then, Quoting from Colossians 1, 16 and 17, For by him, Christ, all things were created in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And this key one verse here. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All right. Then we think of Romans 8, 28, where you have to have, if God is working all things together for a good, then he has to be intervening in the world. So surely God's providence is God's continual intervening in his world, 
moment by moment through his governing of all things and sustaining of all things. Jonathan Edwards um, had an interesting view of providence. He spoke of it in terms of continual creation versus the standard idea of providence being God sustaining his original creation, which, of course, if Edwards is right, that would be miraculous. You know, one God just continually recreating his universe. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think he's correct on that one. But though some state that God's providence is God's ordinary work in creation and miracles are his extraordinary work in creation, um, I tend to see all of uh, providence as quite extraordinary. <laughs> and perhaps I'm equivocating regarding the word extraordinary, but I hope to show that uh, I'm not by the end of this. And by equivocating, I mean changing the meaning of the word extraordinary. All right, the second definition that people give for miracles is that miracles are when God does not use means to do something extraordinary. Or another way to put it, to put it is that um, God works immediately instead of immediately in his creation. That is, he doesn't use a mediator or a mediating stuff or substance to uh, do his miracle. But think of when Jesus used his means, used means, when he turned the water into wine, which was the first sign, according to John, um, or the loaves and fish when he multiplied them. And yet these were certainly miracles. So um, we, we definitely see God using means, um, but they were still extraordinarily miraculous. So that definition I don't think is uh, adequate uh, either. A uh, third definition, and perhaps the most common definition of a miracle, is that a miracle is a suspension of natural laws. Many, many well-known authors speak in these terms, and I understand what they mean. As one man put it, quote, an action, a miracle is an action performed against the laws of nature. God circumventing the very laws that he put into motion, end quote. But some miracles were done through God's use of his nature to accomplish something extraordinary. And it was no less miraculous for that. Think of the examples of uh, where God used the wind in which uh, he blew the quail into the Israelite camp in the wilderness or the wind that the Lord used to blow the locust plague against Egypt. And again, the wind was partially involved in the exodus and the parting of the Red Sea. But that cannot explain the wall of water on both sides of them, though. So in those circumstances, God did not suspend his laws of nature it was more the timing and effect for the miraculous. And it, these, are, these were miracles nevertheless. So that definition won't do either. And, but more significantly, with reference to that last definition, the Bible never really speaks of mechanical natural laws that he has set in motion as that one esteemed theologian put it. God's involvement in governing nature is intensely personal. Is there gravity in other laws? Sure, sure. But I really believe that we have unconsciously adopted a Western mindset which has downplayed the thoroughly supernatural nature of God's involvement with his creation. The word of God does not speak of natural mechanistic laws. And 
Um, again, unconsciously, I think many of us have adopted a uh, nearly deistic mentality. Obviously, I'm aware of modern science and I'm very interested in it. But these laws are our perception of secondary or proximate causes over which the Lord of nature rules supreme and who is intensely personal. It's not like God oversees and then delegates to the mechanistic laws that they do their thing and that he'll occasionally intervene. No, rather he is a one working in and through gravity, etc. Gravity, in my opinion, is an expression of his intensely personal providential government and sustaining of the cosmos. Whether it be gravity, the law of thermodynamics, the laws of motion, and so on, I see these as expressions of all things being personally held together by Jesus as mentioned in Colossians 1.17. Are you following me there? Ours is a world that is governed by a Trinitarian personal God, and he is the covenant ruler of his creation. The regularities of nature are his covenantal gift to us, Genesis 8.22, in which he is present with us in his creation. But that text does not imply mechanistic laws. It just speaks of the general regularity in nature and seasons as a gift to a gift to us. God is not a God of chaos and confusion, but of coherence and order. So the Bible sees God as behind the weather, and when the wind and the waves hear or heard the voice of their master during the storm with the disciples, they obeyed. That is the wind and the waves. Psalm 145 and so many other psalms celebrate that God is to be praised for his miraculous deeds in redemptive history, but equally praised for his equally miraculous provision of food for animals. He sees as miracle what we call providence or answer to prayer and so on. So in the in these um, in the Psalms themselves, you see that God intermixes what we would typically call a miracle with His um, what we would typically call His providence. So, what's my de what's my definition of a miracle? Uh, this is the best I can do, y'all. A miracle is an extraordinary display of God's lordship in which he arouses awe and wonder in people and bears witness to himself. An extraordinary display of God's lordship in which he arouses awe and wonder in people and bears witness to himself. Remember that the Lord, remember the lordship attributes that we talked about early on? Control, authority, and presence, and these help us to further refine our understanding and definition of miracle, I think. The first two, control and authority, accent God's transcendence, and the last, his, his presence, accents his imminence, his closeness. The biblical miracle vocabulary in Hebrew and Greek contains these three perspectives that I just mentioned. For example, we see God's authority in the words uh, in Hebrew, at, and then Greek, semion, which means sign. And as I mentioned, the uh, John in his gospel speaks of signs a lot. Um, with reference to the Lordship attrib attribute of control, the Hebrew word gebura and the Greek word dunamis indicate power or mighty act, and at times it's interpreted miracle. And then lastly, uh, the Lordship attribute of presence 
is indicated by the Hebrew, Hebrew word nifleot, pele, and Greek teras, which is translated wonder. So, going through these, those again, the control of, of God's lordship. Miracles are the result of and display God's omnipotent power. We see this in Exodus 15:6. Throughout Scripture, miracles are mighty works for which God's people praise Him and should cause people to recognize that He alone is the Lord. The recognition formula. God does this so that he might, people might know that he is the Lord. Secondly, in authority, miracles are signs that God, uh, that display God to us, his revelation and authority over nature, Satan, death, and all creation. They authenticate the gospel, which should elicit a response of belief. Um, in quoting from John 20, 31, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples. So that word signs, Samuel, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And as I recall, there are seven signs of Jesus in uh, uh, John's Gospel. Lastly, uh, his covenant presence. Miracles are wonders that provoke a sense of awe that God is present. There's many texts in the Gospels and Acts where miracles of Jesus and the apostles, of where people replied, the response was one of awe of God's awesome presence. Um, quoting from, let's see here. It says, uh, where is this from? I'll find the text in a second. But, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. So you see the um, the covenant presence there as far as you also see the authority as, as well. Because we know that those are three perspectives of the same Lord. All right, now, the Lordship attributes tie into the purpose of miracles. But I want to ask, again, more specifically, if there's reasons given in scripture as to what the purpose of miracles are uh, in addition to those lordship attributes and there are several miracles uh, display god's power as i said his power authority and presence but they also authenticate the gospel as well as the authority of the apostles and of jesus remember the greatest miracle was the resurrection Romans 1.4 and uh, throughout the New Testament. Um, and that was, uh, we see Jesus telling people, you, you know, if you don't believe my words, look at the miracles I'm doing and let them attest to what I'm saying. Um, so again, miracles show God is at work. They also bear witness that the kingdom, we're talking about the purposes of miracles. Okay, so another uh, purpose of miracles is they bear witness that the kingdom of God has come and that God rules, Luke 10, 11, 20. And another purpose is to help those in need, stemming from God's compassion, Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. And as I said, we see from Romans 1.4 and many other passages the great, that the greatest miracle was the resurrection. But, you know, his incarnation, death, and ascension were uh, central miracles as well. Talking about the um, arrival of the kingdom of God, 
Jesus says, But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke 11.20 So the expulsion of demons is an indicator of the arrival and advancing of the kingdom because the king has come and his reign is now and his reign extends over his enemies. Uh, and then verse 14 um, in Matthew 14, 14, when he went ashore, he saw, this is talking about another purpose of the miracles, compassion. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So in, in this case, the purpose for the miracle was God's compassion. So again, one purpose of miracles is to display God's compassion. Um, Nicodemus said this, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with you. John 3.2 with this definition and purposes, I believe that God is doing miracles today. And interestingly, John Frame and Wayne Grudem, who are both Reformed theologians, essentially um, agree. And they are in the circles in which I was, um, in reform circles, they would be pretty much a ref um, minority report. And, um, let me just say this. God is the same Lord today. Um, there, there's no doubt that when Jesus, his time on earth was a unique time in redemptive history in which the apostles lived and worked as well. And yes, there was accelerated demonic activity and extraordinary healings during this time. But that does not negate that miracles have um, still have a place or a function. Uh, is God still in control? Does he still have absolute authority? Is he still covenantally present? In other words, is, is the Lord still the Lord? Of course. Is his kingdom still here and spreading? Is he still casting out evil spirits? Is he still working amazing answers to prayer out of compassion for us? Yes, yes, yes to all. Um, what's the reason that folks um, give to argue that it was just for the apostles uh, that miracles have ceased. What's what's the reasoning that uh, folks give for that? And again, in in my the circles in which um, in my denomination and, and the folks that are in what we would call the Reformed tradition, as opposed to the Arminian, um, most would argue that miracles have ceased. Again, depending upon how you define it. But um, the reason why my dear friends would argue that miracles have ceased is that they see miracles um, as being that their pr primary purpose was to verify the ministries of Jesus and the apostles and to attest to the finality of their revelation. But since the canon is closed, we no longer need miracles. Okay, do you follow that? And my answer to that is, yes, there was a high concentration of demonic activity, as I said, and miracles amongst apostles. But, Again, has demonic activity ceased? Obviously not. Authentication of apostles and of the canon 
was not the only reason given for miracles. It was not the only purpose for miracles. It's not tightly bound up with the canon formulation. That was a significant, very significant part of the purpose of miracles. But we saw other reasons for miracles which are not restricted to the apostles. And if we see providence and answer to prayer as intensely personal, then this sharp distinction that we tend to make between miracle and providence seems to um, fade away some. Miracles, I need to say this, miracles don't save anybody. It's the gospel that, that saves um, if you want to say, if your passion is to safeguard the singular authority of the apostles, as well as the close of the canon, then I'm in emphatic agreement with you. But once again, that is not the only reason or purpose in the Bible for miracles. Now, Please read carefully or listen carefully to this text from Galatians, which I found very instructive. It was addressed to regular folks like you and me, saints in God's eyes, but nevertheless regular people. Notice what it says regarding miracles, quoting from Galatians 3, verse 5. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you. Do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Works miracles is a present participle, ergon dunamis. This text is so clear in that the average Christian was capable of having the Holy Spirit working miracles by faith. Just as we are saved by faith, so the Spirit's working of miracles is by faith. This is not bound to only apostles or apostolic times. Whatever doubt I had before was dispelled by this and other texts. For, now quoting from 1 Corinthians 12, For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. That's probably the word dunamis. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. At Pentecost, which Gerhardus Voss called the semi-eschatological age, the kind of the, pre, the um, now and not yet, in which we have we have entered into the end times. We kind of got one foot in on earth and one foot in heaven, semi-eschatological age. The fullness of Pentecost, the presence of the Lord, the fullness of the Pentecost in which um, the Holy Spirit was pulled out indicated the presence of the Lord with all his control, power, and authority and presence. And we continue to need signs of bearing witness to the kingdom of God as well as to show compassion to others and to fight against the enemy. Surely, surely the exorcisms of Jesus were seen as signs that, it says so, that he was empowered by the Holy Spirit and the kingdom had arrived because the king had arrived. And these were seen as miracles, the exorcisms. He himself says so. So let me ask a question, okay? 
why would the freeing of people from demonic bondage be seen clearly as miraculous then, but not be seen as miraculous today? If you say that demonic oppression or possession does not occur today, then you are simply wrong. The paganization of our culture has turned our country into a situation that only cross-cultural missionaries used to encounter not just too long ago. And I say that with tears. Okay, I do not normally share my experiences regarding the supernatural. You know, I haven't done so on here yet, but I, I need to here. While I was writing my book, Seeing Goes Through God's Eyes, using proof to expose one of Satan's most effective lies, ghosts or earthbound spirits, late one night, I was sitting in a chair just like this. Okay, I was working away very intense. All of a sudden, out of the blue, I was overcome with a sense of dread and fear that I've never felt before. It was like it was infused inside of me from an outside source. It was. I was physically thrown back in my chair and pinned back like that. I couldn't move. And then an audible voice and I mean just a little whisper or one in my head, an audible voice loudly said, you are a, and then a couple of expletives came out. That was my first experience with rebuking evil spirits. But since then, I had been involved in about 100 cases of demonic oppression and possession. The latter were admittedly much less frequent, but they are becoming increasingly common as our culture becomes more and more pagan and God's common grace protective shield is removed. So many, for, so many formerly forbidden doors are being opened with tragic frequency. I have seen countless counterfeit miracles and I have faced off pure evil. I appeared over the rim of hell. And I have also commanded evil spirits to depart from persons and homes, as have my dear friends Laura, Dana, and Ivani, to whom I dedicate this segment, because they have been my inspiration and my dearest friends and have taught me so much about what the Bible has to say about victory in and over Satan, what the Bible teaches. Why would these not be seen as miracles as they were when Jesus and the disciples? When I go into a house and I see there's a shadow figure and it's moving and I see people, th uh, things happening that are really bizarre. Okay, things floating and flying across the room. Uh, people being scratched, uh, pushed down the stairs, um, animals being killed, and all kinds of horrible things. I walk in there and I say, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, any unclean spirits you must leave now and not come back. Okay, that is a truth and power encounter between demons and the power of God, which brings glory to God and shows his kingdom is still advancing and it elicits awe in the folks that we help. And I've shared that joy with my dear three sisters. We don't have to go to the inner recesses of Africa anymore to see a shaman placing curses on people. It happens here. This has become my life to some extent for the last 10 years, but it centers around the gospel, which is the only thing that saves. There is something deeply affirming in my heart, y'all. When I walk into a house, I feel like a little boy because I know that in myself, the, the weakest demon could 
could tear me to shreds. But in Christ, I'm a more than conqueror. But in each case, when I see sometimes literally the demons flee in Jesus' name, like shadow figures flying out the door. Uh, it's uh, there's something that's so affirming in my heart um, in, in seeing the truth that Christ is present and that his authority, his kingdom is still advancing. That he's doing a miracle through a weak, fallen guy like me through faith. And I've seen folks open to the gospel like never before. I don't have the gift of evangelism, but I've led a lot of folks to Christ because of the cleansing of themselves or their homes. And, and that authentication of the gospel has opened them up to um, wanting to, um, to look to Christ. And uh, so again, the miracle of the cleansing of the house attested to the veracity of the gospel, and it led to people being saved. I see that as a miracle. But, but perhaps the biggest miracle today, and as always, is the salvation of a sinner who's dead in sin. Is, is answer to prayer a miracle? I think it can be. It is a spectrum, I think a continuum, and not a sharp distinction between providence and miracle. For example, in Psalm 145, the great works and signs of God, um, say, of the Exodus, uh, are equally attributed to God's miraculous um, working as his providential care of animals. Or I guess put it another way, uh, the, uh, the exodus as well as God's providential care of animals are seen equally as being miraculous um, in Psalm 145 and many, many other psalms. There doesn't seem to be this compartmentalization that I and, and uh, others have tended to do. Um, there's something supremely very personal about God's care for his, and, and miraculous about his uh, providential care for his people. So bearing witness through prayer. Um, think of a situation you, in your own life. Uh, think of like a, um, a non-Christian friend or neighbor, okay, and just this situation. Uh, say your your non-Christian friend has a child, and and they tell you in confidence that their their child is is, is struggling with um, having lurid, luridly bad dreams, and, and you say, um, "May I pray um, for your daughter?" And so you pray out loud, and just something very simple, uh, but out loud, and just ask the Lord to. Um, uh, to release this girl of her fear and to get rid of any unclean spirits that might be causing it and um, finish it off. And then next time you see your friend, lo and behold, he says, hey, guess what? That night it stopped. Well, I, guess I see that like a, a miraculous answer to prayer. This gives glory to God and it may very well draw your friend to Christ. Because that answer to prayer authenticated, authenticated the gospel, which was part of the, one, of the, one of the purposes of it. So I, I think you call that a miracle. We do need to be cautious of counter, counterfeit miracles, though. That doesn't mean that when talking about counterfeit miracles, that, um, that doesn't mean they are not supernatural. Counterfeit miracles are supernatural. Uh, we see this in Exodus 2. It's quite clear to me that the court, sor court sorcerers um, for Pharaoh were using demonic powers to, 
to mimic a few of the plagues. And then in Revelation 13, we see the beast when Christ, um, right before Christ comes back, there will be an acceleration of demonic activity, the Antichrist and all that. But the beast will show extraordinary displays of counterfeit miracles. Uh, and this is going to happen sometime in the future. Um, this complex of events is going to happen. And uh, it will have a deluding effect on many people because they will not be discerning. They'll see the supernatural signs and wonders and it'll wow them. And, you know, let me read that text. Revelation 13. It's, then I saw another beast rising out of the earth that had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and made makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So you have there a confluence of counterfeit miracles with a falsification of the gospel. They, they go hand in hand. We need to be discerning, 1 John 4, 4. The content of the gospel and the behavior of people um, need to be examined. Uh, in 1 John 4, 4, the test is that there are demon-led teachers versus spirit-led teachers, and the, the difference is, is discerned via a Christology te test. In the end times before Christ returns, there will be an acceleration of demonic activity. So we will need accelerated activity of the Holy Spirit as well to counterattack. There are well-known folks who speak very little of the gospel but repeat the same words over and over and over again. It has this hypnotic effect on the kids um, or adults. And then there's these bizarre effects. But there are extraordinary things going on. But remember, not everything that's supernaturally extraordinary is from God. There's this supernatural evil. On the other hand, we, have, we must not be overly suspicious just because a brother or a sister is doing something a bit different or does not believe just as we do. Okay, now there, there are certain things that are definitely wrong that I'm seeing happening that are just um, out of line with how God would do things. And But getting back to my point is that we, we don't want to be overly critical or we're gonna, we'll end up calling something demonic that the Holy Spirit is doing. I certainly don't want to do that. Um, you don't want to see God's power or don't you want to see God's power unleashed in his fullness I know you do that's in all of our hearts um, above I quoted from a famous theologian about miracles being God's breaking of natural laws he set in motion um, what I didn't quote was he then cites an extreme case of raising an already decomposing body from the dead like four days dead now is that possible today that kind of miracle uh, i don't know god certainly can raise people from the dead and there's reasons why i have doubt about the raising of the dead especially especially those who are decomposing and been dead for four days like lazarus i looked through the bible um as carefully as i could and i may be mistaken but i think the only clear case of raising decomposing dead is jesus and jesus with lazarus if you think of elijah and elisha 
who both raised boys who had died. In 1 Kings 17, it seems that he was raised the same day. I can't tell. But with the Shunammite son in 2 Kings 4, it does seem to be uh, raising him on the same day because there was a whole lot of rushing around by everyone. The woman was running. Um, as soon as the child died, um, Gehazi, he had to hitch up his clothes because uh, Elisha told him to run. Uh, I, I assume that he ran as well, Elisha. Um, but um, so we don't see a lot. And I just don't, I, I'm not an expert in this area. I'm just, I don't know who it is. And I'm not sure how much to trust what you see on the internet. But the same reasons that I give for why I argue against earthbound spirits seem to come into play here to some extent. The Bible indicates that immediately upon death, we are sent to God for judgment and our souls are sent to heaven and hell. Since the vast majority of people who die are unbelievers, then I can't, cannot see them being able to be released from hell uh, by being raised from the dead. As for believers, I question as to whether they would want to come back after being with the Lord for, I'm talking about four days dead. Okay, four, ten days, something like that, not half hour or something like that, or even four hours if they've been under ice. Either way, if you look closely, death is, according to biblical categories, in a special category of miracles. There is a finality to death where the soul is ripped asunder from the body. You know, where does the soul go for those four days? Um, in this case, I just have to acknowledge that, you know, I'm not Jesus. I've already affirmed that um, it's clear that the Bible teaches that uh, miracles are still alive and well. I'm just saying that I'm struggling with the idea of, of um, several day decomposing uh, raising from the dead uh, and again death be, being seen as the last uh, enemy I think about that more in closing in my heart and mind I long to see God maximally glorified in and through me and through us May we not unintentionally limit the extent to which God reveals that he is still the living God in 2018 by having a pre-packaged view of miracles which we're not willing to think through. I hope this has helped. I hope this discussion has given you more of a sense of a childlike belief that God can work miracles in our midst by faith in Christ. And with more boldness and anticipation and in doing so that you'll see more remarkable answers to prayer that bring glory to God in all in the eyes of, of um, people, but bring first and foremost point to the fact that our holy king, um, that his kingdom is advancing forcefully. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have given us your word. We know that you are omnipotent and we pray that we might not limit your power in us by various forms of unbelief, but also pray that we may not try to 
grasp that which is not promised to us in this side of heaven. So clarify in our minds, Father, that you're still the living God. That much is certain. And we thank you that you love us and that uh, you preserve us and sustain us. In Jesus' name, amen.